a lot of my poems, I, I, I go to Rouge Lounge, which some of you may, may know it. It has uh, poetry. It's kind of the preeminent place to do poetry in the evenings once a week on Tuesday night. It's Jasper and 117th. Everybody else there is talking about the usual subjects of poetry, which would be um, important subjects in your life, you know, romance, human relationships, loss, all that kind of thing. The usual things that inspires song lyrics. And of course, there is two different kinds of success in poetry. There are poets who are good at, at uh, poetry on the stage and poets who are good at poetry on the page. And some poets can, can, can do both. But as you might, might imagine, with some of my subjects, since it's just a general sort of slice of Edmonton uh, young people there, that uh, they're, they're, they may, they're not entirely mentally prepared for the, the AI-oriented subjects. But it still works pretty well, and they, they've gotten used to it. So I, I thought I would read you two poems, and, and then I'll go and I'll tell you a little bit about the course and, and so on. But the thing to maybe interest you a bit before I read the poems is for you to know that, first of all, People from all faculties take our course. And although it is a graduate course, most of the students are undergraduates every time. It, it's a bit unusual. So it's Lab MP 590. It sounds like a very high level course. It is graded like a graduate course, which means if everybody does well, everybody can get, get a really high grade. You don't have to have any, any sort of uh, bell-shaped curve with the grades. But very often, it's mainly young people like yourself and uh, undergraduates taking the course. They each have to be uh, interviewed by me, but I've never turned anyone down, so it's a pretty benign process being interviewed. OK, so both of these really relate uh, directly to my interaction with Dr. Sutton and, 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 and my thinking about what the future relationship between AI and uh, human races and what the outcome is going to be when machines become smarter than first individual humans and then, then the whole human race. The first poem mentions uh, the Puerto Rico meeting uh, directly. A big picture wish for diversity. Solving the general case saves the human race. In January 2015 in Puerto Rico, AI researchers tossed to and fro ideas about how to contain machine superintelligence and how it required super vigilance to keep the AIs hemmed in so they can't do us in and slaving the bots is necessary so they can't decide they don't want nary any humans around. Suspicions abound, no trust will be found. All drones will be downed with evil, primeval exuding from every bot navel. But isn't it possible that humans will be able to build in friendly demeanor in the bots manufacture so that as long as we treat them with respect, they will be equally friendly and circumspect, and empathy and high regard can flow in both directions, between us and them with proper introspections. For both us and them, a win-win situation. We go through life with good cooperation as we each find strength and diversity and human bot teams save the day and every other day after that, well, why not? And then as the AIs become smarter even, they will still want us around in their garden of Eden. Our welfare and theirs will be tied together and that then becomes the plan forever. The second poem I'm going, going to read, some of you may have noticed 
that, uh, you know, we don't get that much wildlife in the city, but there was a report of a bear in Emily Murphy Park. Now, M Emily Murphy Park is right in the center of the city, and, you know, that, that, that was quite surprising. Uh, <clears throat> and it influences behavior, uh, behavior of humans, behavior of pets, behavior of humans with their pets, and that's what this is about, part of what, it, what it's about. Pets who trust, that will be us. Spending the night between the front door and the screen door. A bear was spotted in Emily Murphy Park region, so on Wednesday night we decided, decided to keep our cat in. This was not a popular decision with the cat in question, who kept charging at the doors head on. But we were steadfast in our resolve to provide protection against bears and coyotes and their brethren. We closed the doors and went to bed thinking all was just fine. And nothing bad would happen to our favorite feline. But during the night, there was not a sound. No cat noises intruding on our dreams were found. And the next morning, we awoke to a catless house landscape and thought, how can this be? He could not escape. We opened the front door and were astonished to discover the cat between that door and the screen door did hover, making nary a sound, but eager to eat, with a seeming unperturbed, but with a small pile of cat fur beneath his feet but otherwise unscathed and seeming to say, I totally trust you. I knew you would come through. You always do. Now today, Steve Wozniak of Apple fame says we will be pets. He makes that claim. Says intelligent robots will make pets of us and keep us around as a nature bonus. They will be as good masters as we are to our pets today, enjoying our cute antics, hooray, hooray. I'm sure there will be the occasional screen door miscalculations, but the bots will also provide us with amazing augmentations, and when the relationship goes slightly awry, we can relax knowing we'll again see the sky and we can say to our benevolent bot to whom we owe such an awful lot i totally trust you i knew you would come through you always do okay so with that that is background the question then is like not all of you like poetry, not all of you were comfortable during that, and how well am I selling what I'm doing in the course? And one indication of that, I think, is the reaction of the Central University, which I found quite remarkable. So in the uh, New Trail magazine, which most of you know is the official University of Alberta Alumni Office publication goes to, I don't know, thousands and thousands of people. They decided to devote the winter issue, which um, sort of went to press last Friday, but will be fully out and distributed to everybody by the middle of December, to the future of everything. And they have a rule that in good journalism, you never have quotes from the same person in like two different stories in the same issue. But with me, they violated that. So you find on your table the, the, the two different things, and, and, and they became so enamored of what we're doing in the course of the cross-disciplinary nature. And then they asked me who else to, to interview. So the people interviewed, Many of them are people who teach in the course. It includes Dr. Sutton and, and Osmer, uh, Zion, and, and, and uh, it, it's just <laughs> the most remarkable thing. 
So somehow, and I don't know whether it's through any cleverness or through some accidental thing, that the Central University seems to, right now at this moment in time, be quite keen on this particular area. And the other thing that's surprising, when you read the quote from Dr. Sutton, when you read the quote from me, I think probably both in his case and in mine, I don't remember these being the main themes of, of my conversation with you know, the interviewer, his interest, and how they picked out the things that for a general audience would be most interesting. And they have done, with my words, something I could never have done. They've, it made it more accessible, like there are no barriers. There are no, like if I had used the word singularity, which I was likely to do over and over, you'll, you'll notice in that article, Medicine Writ Large, the word singularity is nowhere to be found. So if you don't like the word or don't know what the word means, it's no barrier. And, and I think they've done a much better job there of, of, of making it something that would be broadly appealing than I ever could have done. So it's a good partnership between people like Dr. Sutton and myself and the PR people of the main central university. Now, so I, I've, I've sold something to the central university. Can I sell it to you? We have a course that can contain up to 40 students, but we've never had more than 14. And maybe my speaking to you today can change that. But of course, I don't know how successful I'm, I'm being. I'm not getting that much eye contact. I'm getting a little bit of, God, I wonder how long this guy's going to talk. But this is the most interdisciplinary course you could possibly imagine. The word medicine is in the title because I'm in the faculty of medicine, and I thought I might get in trouble if it appeared this course had nothing to do with medicine. But it does not require any medical knowledge or medical background. And most of the classes will not seem to you to be about medicine at all. It's just technology and the future. So it fits in exactly with what your interests already are. The things that cause you to take Dr. Sutton's course would be the same thing that would cause you to find my course interesting. And um, it's true that if you're an undergraduate, you would have to be interviewed by, by me, but it can not only be a very benign process, but very brief. Also, I just need your student number and send this to our departmental administrator and you're in the course. Um, we, I often meet at Good Earth uh, Cafe. Some of you may have seen me in there. <laughs> I mean, they're quite a bit sort of uh, talking with students, but we don't have to even do that. It can be a much briefer encounter. It can be in this building. It can be whatever you want. So I, I think you would profit from, you would enjoy it, and if you want to know what it's like, we have so many videos. You could spend the rest of your existence on this planet just watching the existing videos from the court. So there's no secret about what it's like, and you, you can look at the highest rated video, and of course Jonathan Schaefer has the highest rated video thus far. Uh, but we, I think there would be bound to be subjects in there that have always intrigued you, like quantum biology. That's what, what we did the previous two lectures. Uh, you, you know what quantum physics is, and, and you know, the, the concepts but many of those concepts also apply to biology. Many of the most, ex most interesting things about uh, uh, biology can only be explained through quantum things. So we, we, we talk about uh, what's going to happen as machines become smarter than human beings, but also how that plays out in all different parts of the world, whether it's going to be a simultaneous thing where suddenly we wake up, the whole world has changed, how is that possible? Or whether it's going to be very slow, or maybe that it will be in Silicon Valley only, or you know, how equitable, how worldwide is this change? Is it going to be a positive change? 
can, can we influence it? I, I think the, the bottom line that I would leave you with is that the reason to take the course really is it increases the likelihood that you can impact the future in a meaningful way. You, I mean, we could be facing apocalypse, we could be facing the most fantastic utopia you've ever imagined, and by taking the course, you become just a little bit more able and capable of, of helping to steer things in the right direction and, and of knowing what's actually coming. Like a lot of the teaching that you receive assumes that the world is the way it's been in the past 50 years. Will you cha train for one career and that's the job you have for the rest of your life and that's, that's the way things are and there's a lot of precedent for the job you're going to have and the job has a name that it's known today. Or as you, you know, your actual futures, you'll probably have five different jobs and the last three of them, the names don't even exist yet. So that, that, that's kind of a thing where we say that the course, my course, Technology in the Future of Medicine, makes you street smart for the future. And you probably all need that. And the other thing that you might be thinking is this guy is like, is he like twice as old as me or three times or chase, you know? We have a lot of people teaching in the course who are your own age. And we, we pride ourselves in that. People who first take the course as students and then very soon thereafter end up teaching in, in the course. I think you'll find that very exciting. And it's obvious to you in the um, videos from the course that that is the case. And we may even have people that you know personally who, who are uh, teaching in the course. And I'm very proud of the fact that the average age of the people teaching in the course is going down and down and down. I, I don't know what the, what, what the lowest point that average age could reach, but you, you can help me speculate about that. So by taking the course, you become part of a system. We also have a student group for the course. Not exactly for the course, it's for the subject. You, you, it turns out you can't have a student group that's specific to one course. So it, it's a group on technology in the future of medicine, but it's not specific to this course. So I, I'd be happy to answer any questions about uh, this, and, and I, I, I hope uh, that you have found my presence here. <laughs> not just surprising, but maybe a little bit you know, instructive giving you a taste of the world out, out there. People have taken our course from every faculty. So it's not just interesting the, 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 the people teaching you, but the interaction with the other students is also very, very interesting. I, I mean, if you think about the four people in this room and their life, life experience and so on, they are not the same, like these four People, you know, you wouldn't say, well, geez, you know, they're, they're, they're just, <laughs> they look like they all came from the same mold. They don't all come from the same mold. Um, got people from, you know, Kazakhstan, I mean, I mean you know, it, it's, it, and from all different walks of life. So I, I think you would find it inspiring from that point of view. And most of the people who, it, just by chance, <laughs> Uh, most of the people who have taken the course, um, or let, let's say about a third, because it's quite varied, but if you had to pick one particular characteristic that was more common in, in students taking the course than any other, it's that they came from computing science. Not, not all of them, but more of them came from that area than any other. So it's not like you're, you're the first person from that area Join us. So, any, any questions? Yeah. Who teaches the ethics portion of your class? That's very interesting. So, Earl Waugh, who was uh, uh, in uh, religious studies for most of his regular career until age 65. At age 65, he moved to the Faculty of Medicine and uh, started a new career in a sort of 
cross-cultural medicine. But wait, wait a minute, this is not the answer to your question. It's like the, the prelim, right? So he's been teaching the ethics. And this year he, he told me, Kim, I'm getting too old to teach. We have to find a 20-year-old to teach what I've been teaching. I said, do you have any suggestions? He said, nope. It's up to you. <laughs> I said, well, what about Kara Prasad? What could she do? He said, I don't know. So I said, let's see. So now, she, I, I, she is 20-something. I don't know exactly what, but she, she's uh, similar to you guys in age. She was the president of the Students for International Health, and she, 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 she's been quite a student leader, but she's otherwise just an ordinary student like you. So now, Dr. Wah and I are helping her prepare the lectures, but she is the lecturer, and, and she's doing very, very well. You can look at her three YouTube um, videos, and I, I, I don't think you'll find any flaws there. So she's like a person your own age, talking about something where people think that life, life experience is like really necessary to get this stuff, and, and yet she is uh, doing it very, very well from the vantage point of a young person being sort of mentored by two older people. Any other questions? Yes, Joseph. Uh, yeah, I, I am taking the course, and I would like to know uh, why artificial intelligence is a big portion of the... Yeah, of well, the, the, a, AI is such a big portion of the course because AI represents the largest existential risk out, out. So you can think of all sorts of other scary things that could happen in the future. But I, I think it, it is the most tangible and most obvious thing that, that could end the human race. It could also lead to a human existence that is superior to anything you've ever imagined. You wake up in the morning and you think of all the things you want to do and want to have that are just unattainable for you. There could be a future where that is not true at all where anything you want, you can have, any experience you want, you know, virtual reality can be better than real reality and shareable with friends and all the other things. So you, you can imagine a future where suddenly there are no limits and the things you want and the experiences you want, you can have. And then what choices will you make? So I mean, that's, but there's also the opposite. I, I've, I've learned, I'm getting better at talking about the, the bad side, you know, the you know, apocalyptic side. But I always seem to end in a very positive vein, even when I talk about that. But both are possible. By taking a course, you can make the utopia a little bit more likely and the dismal apocalypse a little less. Other questions? Yes. So I have a question kind of for, for the students. Uh, you know, I'm wondering what concerns, you know, they might have you know, taking a course like this, uh, you know, like what would you think uh, would inhibit or, or make you more likely to do it? I mean, are there issues like uh, requirements? And yeah, so, so there are no prereqs. Uh, you, you have to be uh, like brave enough to, to, to be interviewed by me, but most of you look pretty brave. <laughs> yes. What are the assignments like? What is the work like? So, so the work, you, you, there is one um, midterm exam. There's no final exam. And the midterm exam, the first day of class, you get an exam to see sort of where you are. And, and so we were kind of comparing the, the two. And so from that you know, assessment of, of entering knowledge, you get a pretty good idea of what subjects will be on the midterm, what are the main themes of the course, because that's what we're asking you about on, on that uh, quiz the first day. The, the main marks from the course come from a 20-minute presentation and from your final paper. 
so, so, and those are generally both on the same subject. Your um, paper is due a week before the presentation, so I can give you some feedback on the paper that may, you know, improve your uh, presentations. And the presentations can be life-changing. Cha We've had people that once <laughs> the presentation goes up on YouTube, they get a job offer from a new startup in uh, New York City that they never heard of, but it's like their dream job, and, and, and you know, it just sort of continues on from there. So, so there are more and more stories like that of the very positive effects of, 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 of having that um, presentation video. I think no matter what you want to do in the future, the experience of taking a course and of doing the paper and the, the video is, is, is bound to be a positive sort of life, life enhancer. Well, Kim, I'd like to thank you for your plain speaking and for your poetry. Thank you. Your perspectives. And uh, thank you very much for coming and speaking to us.